Okay, here we go. So welcome everyone to the first Florida Drupal virtual meetup. This one is 100% virtual. Um, the plan moving forward is that each geographic region will host a meetup each month. Um, and this first one is actually Brevard County's turn, which is you know where I am. Uh, but our in-person meetup is not happening because the internet at my office currently sucks. So it's going to have to wait till the next time that it comes around for us. And uh, then we'll have an in-person meetup, um, which will be broadcast just like this one is. Um, so that is the plan for, um, for right now. So in a couple of minutes, I'll be talking about 11 tips to start your Drupal project right. It's kind of a nice, lightweight, easy topic just so we can kind of work out the kinks of these uh, virtual meetups. And I will mention that next month's meetup is June 18th, 6 p.m. There will be an updated um, uh, link. So this Zoom link will be obsolete because um, we're going to have a permanent one with a bit.ly, so it's nice and easy to remember. Adam was just setting that up. Um, but there is an in-person meetup that will be broadcast next month, June 18th, 6 p.m. in Jacksonville. Chris Crawford talking about porting the scanner module from D7 to D8. Ooh. So I meant to look this up. I think scanner, doesn't that like um, search and replace, right? Yeah, search and replace, um, is it during migrations? No, it's after the content's already there. You can like do a search and replace across like body fields and other fields. So um, there's a Drupal 7 version right now. So I suppose that Chris will be talking about migrating that to Drupal 8. So that will be interesting. And there's a whole schedule um, on the Florida uh, Drupal group. Um, as far as who is presenting when and where moving forward. I don't, I don't want to take the time to, uh, well, let me see, maybe I won't real quick. If I go to, is there an easy way to get to that? If I go to Florida, let's just look at the whole schedule real quick. And uh, how to introducing, I think this is it. Yeah, okay, so June is that one. Oh, I thought we had more. Scheduled. I think after that, well, I'm not. Even, I don't know the actual. I don't want to guess what they are. Um, I do know, and Hector, I know that you guys actually always broadcast yours, and you guys have one coming up this Wednesday, two days from now. Yeah. Um, talking about uh, relatively relativity or Drupal camps. Yeah, and Jay has the July slot, if I'm not mistaken. For oh, the, okay. For the, yeah. yeah okay, so June is Jacksonville. You guys are July, and then I'm pretty sure Tampa is August. If that sounds right. Yeah, we're okay. July, yeah. Yeah, good, 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 good. All right, very good. Well, let us, I'm going to get going here. So if you have any questions, you can either interrupt me or just put it in the group chat, in the Zoom chat. Um, and yeah, so let's get going. So if you're at Florida Drupal Camp, you may have already seen this one, but that's okay. Um, so it's 11 tips to start your Drupal 8 project right. So um, who am I? I think most people who are at least here in the room here know who I am. Those of you who are watching the recording, you can read this and um, I don't have to spend too much time on that. Um, the reason I came up with this presentation is because I've been doing this for 13 plus years, um, Drupal specifically, and you know, PHP and you know, ASP and Cold Fusion projects for longer than that. And I've worked with a lot of organizations on a lot of Drupal projects. And I've seen a lot of good things and I've seen a lot of bad things. Um, things that cost money and things that save money. So I think I'm, you know, I'm finally, maybe not finally, but I'm in the position where I am comfortable, you know, in my own skin telling people that, hey, that's not gonna work out so well. Um, so I figured I'd kind of codify uh, 11 of those things and, um, and present on it. So here we are. So like I said, something, I have something to offer here. Um, so the idea behind this stuff is, and this is what really gets me, is a lot of times everyone knows they should be doing a lot of these things, but you don't necessarily start off the project using these things. And it becomes really, really difficult to, um, to fix a broken process once the, the project is underway. So I'm a big believer that if you start off on the right foot, you really set the tone for the entire project. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, like I said, if you start off on the wrong foot, you know, and you make a bad decision early, it rarely gets corrected because it tends to be expensive to correct. Um, if you, you know, don't do your due diligence, and this is a big one for me, if you don't do your due diligence setting up entities and fields and bundles, um, and you build views on top of them and theming on top of them, it's really hard to go back and refactor that stuff because it will just take a lot of time and a lot of money that clients don't necessarily want to spend. So um, that's why I'm, I'm a big believer in just doing the hard work up front so that you are sure that you have the best possible uh, foundation to build upon. And what that will do is minimize the total co cost of ownership for your site. If you do things right, from the very beginning, your site will be more sustainable. It will be easier to maintain, easier to, um, to extend, easier to uh, keep upgraded, and you know, easier to move to Drupal 9 in the, in, in the future. Um, if you make mistakes early, then you know, bad things can happen. All right, so number one. So a lot of these, I'm just looking at the people here. I think all of this, is, a lot of this is gonna be review for everybody, but. I'm not too concerned about it. Um, you really have to commit to local dev stage production workflow, some type of multi-environment workflow um, where the work is actually done locally, where you know developers have a local version of the site up and running locally. Um, you have to get in the mindset that it's disposable so that if something goes sideways with it, not a big deal, delete it, reclone, get a copy of the database and, and get back up and running again. Um, Doing real work on a remote server is problematic for a number of reasons. Um, number one, latency. Um, and number two, if more than one person is looking at that remote server, um, you know, and you accidentally, you know, forget, miss a semicolon and white screen of death, everyone, that can, you know, that can be annoying. Um, and then, on the remote side of things, when you have, you know, a dev in a stage in a production or a dev in a QA in a production or a dev in a test in a production or, you know, dev and then maybe multiple devs, um, one for each Git branch. When you have that, that process set up, um, in general, you're making changes locally. You're pushing them up to a dev environment where you're making sure everything works. Maybe other members of your team are reviewing it and giving you feedback. Um, once everything looks good on dev, you're deploying that to stage where maybe, you know, your latest code is being married to the latest database and, you know, the environment configuration on stage is exactly the same as production. So you are pretty darn confident that if it works on stage, it's going to be work, it's going to work on production. Um, so the goal is by the time you deploy your code changes to production, it should be a non-event meaning you should know exactly what's gonna happen, you should know exactly what steps are gonna be needed to move to production because you've already done it on, on dev and stage. Um, so you really need to get this set up the first thing. Um, you know, you get your Drupal 8 code base up and going and you get your remote environments and your, and your developer workflow um, organized. Um, this is a, you know, basically a diagram showing um, you know, local dev, test, and production. Um, and I use this all the time to teach code flows up and data flows down. So you'll notice on the remote Git repository, there's only one way in, and that's from a local development environment. Um, ideally, anything that you're doing that's going to change code or config in Drupal 8 should be done on local. And then all of your dev environments, all of your test environments, and your production environment are just pulling from that repository, meaning you're not changing code on dev or changing code on test or changing config anywhere. You're only ever doing that stuff locally and pushing into your remote and pulling upstream. Um, and then on the right-hand side is your data. In, in, in Drupal, you know, it's your database and your files directory. And the idea is that you are never pushing data up. You know, you are always, you know, um, if you need to update your local, you're going to pull down a, a database from production usually, usually. Maybe you get it from test, maybe it's a sanitized version from somewhere. But in general, data is coming from a remote environment um, that is quote unquote above you. 
Um, and granted, there are edge cases for all of this stuff. You know, if, if it's a new build and you don't have a production environment yet, then yes, obviously you're going to be moving a database up to production, but that's normally a one-time thing. Once you have all of your environments set up, in general, you're only ever, you know, moving code, I'm sorry, moving data down. So code goes up and data flows down, is the idea. Number two, this seems like an obvious one, um, but I still, to this day, I have new clients that don't use project trackers and it makes me, it makes me nutty. Or, I, or I, I actually have a new client that is a part-time user for project tracker. And I asked them to explain that and said, well, you know, they said, you know, at the beginning we put all the tasks in there, but as we do tasks, we don't necessarily update everything in the project tracker. So I'm like, okay, so what, where's the value? You know, what, what are you getting out of the project tracker? They're like, well, you know, maybe a couple times a month we go in there and, and mark if something's complete or not. Um, and so I'm, you know, I kind of, I pressed a little bit more and said, well, if, what if there's a question about one of the tasks? And they're like, well, we use Slack or we use email for that. So it kind of defeats the purpose of using a project tracker. Um, for clients that I work with that don't have a project tracker, I kind of insist that if they don't have one, then they're going to use mine. Um, and for tasks that I'm going to be working on, you know, we can use my project tracker. Um, I just, I just find it, you know, it, it, it's all about accountability and making sure things don't fall through the cracks. And if you're using, oh, let me just go back. If you're using Git, then your, or you should be using Git. When you use Git, your commit messages should include references back to your project tracker. So every commit, the commit message should say that this commit is related to task number 314 or whatever the unique identifier is in your project tracker. Um, and it doesn't really matter to me what project tracker uh, you use. You just have to find something that works for your team. Um, there's a lot of really great project trackers out there, some free, some paid, some you can self-host, some that's um, um, software as a service. Um, just find something that works for your team and your developer workflow and stick with it. If you're not using Git, we probably should just, you should probably stop watching this right now and go learn Git. Um, Surprisingly, I've, you know, every now and then, you know, maybe once a year, I come across a client that isn't using Git, and that's kind of one of the requirements for me. Um, if, if you're going to hire me to work on your project, you know, it has to be in version control. They're just, it seems wildly irresponsible for it not to be in version control. So that's all I'm going to say about that one. Um, so here's one that is, is, you know, there's a little bit of friction with this one, especially with Drupal 8, um, because Composer is new. Um, but really, we all should be using Composer to manage our Drupal 8 code bases. Um, there's really no reason not to, other than the learning curve. And it's not a huge learning curve. You can get by with literally a handful of commands um, and some cheat sheets. Um, but it's one of those things where moving forward, only more and more sites are going to be using Composer. Only more and more projects are going to be using Composer. I have a I have a comment on this. Yeah, go. Um, I saw a tweet from uh, Gabor Hoitzi, who's a uh, one of the primary Drupal uh, core maintainers, and it looks like Drupal there's an issue in the Drupal nine queue that is uh, talking about doing away with a module or a themes info.yaml file and going just with a composer JSON file. Yeah, there's actually a lot of momentum right now. Mm -hmm. Um, in basically taking what, and so here, let me escape out of this real quick. Sorry to get you off track there. No, 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 no. We got time. No, I want to go to GitHub. You can see it's like the, if I start typing GitHub, this is the number one thing. This is kind of the, the one of the best practice ways of using a Drupal 8 with composers is Drupal Composer, Drupal Project Template. Um, there's a lot of momentum right now in bringing this into Drupal.org as an official project. Maybe not, it's not gonna be exactly this, um, but it's gonna be pretty darn close. There's gonna be different flavors for it. There's gonna be like a developer flavor um, that's gonna be very similar to this. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that there's, going, there's some work going on. There's some work going on to make it so that 
the tar files that drupal.org provides are actually generated from the composer template. So you can still use the tar.gz download file to get Drupal 8 up and running, um, but it's going to be it's going to be hidden from you a bit. You're going to have to work to get to it because um, it's really not going to be the recommended way to do it. Um, so yeah, so use a composer template. There's a few out there. The one I just showed you is probably the one that most people use. Um, if you are interested in, in learning about that, uh, let me know. I actually am in the process of developing a composer uh, workshop, which I'm going to give online. Uh, there'll be a paid workshop give, give online in the future. But let me know if you're inter interested in that. But anyway, use Composer. Um, so this is a, number five. This is one that is really just starting to gain momentum in the last year or two, and that's use a consistent local development environment for the entire team. So in the, in the olden days, someone someone needs to mute. Who's that? Uh, Knut. Hey, Knut, can you mute your microphone? I think there we go. Thank you. So in the old days, before Drupal 8, it was kind of the Wild West, you know, some people use MAMP, some people use WAMP, some people use Drupal VM, some people use, you know, homegrown, you know, just home, not homegrown, but installed everything themselves on, you know, directly on their hardware. Um, and what that leads to is everyone is, you know, on their local kind of has a different environment configuration. Slightly different versions of PHP, slightly different versions of MariaDB or MySQL, slightly different memory requirements. Um, with Docker-based tools, um, as well as you know, Drupal VM, we are rapidly moving towards the place where it is relatively easy for the entire team to use consistent local development environments. Um, Doxel and DDEV and Lando, um, allow you to configure the local development environment and commit it to the repository. So that when you clone a project, if that, you know, if the whole team is using Lando, then the configuration for that project is part of the repository. You just have to, you know, fire up your Lando containers and it's, and they will be configured um, identically to everybody else's on the team. And that's really useful for avoiding the, well, it worked on my machine type of issues. So I would say if you are starting a new project with more than one person, have this conversation about, hey, what, you know, what local development environment should we use that we can you know, kind of use together and keep consistent? Um, and not only is it valuable for like versions of PHP and things like that, but you know, this way, if you have solar, um, everybody can have a solar container. If there are te automated testing tools, um, that are necessary. Everybody can have those installed as part of, you know, the the environment configuration. So yeah, so Hector uh, just mentioned on the chat here in uh, DrupalCon Seattle, um, Acquia announces Acquia Developer Studio, which kind of um, Hector, you want to you want to talk about it for like a minute, real quick, just to give an overview, so I don't have to stumble over it. Well, it's just like in the works. It's something that's coming that Aqua's okay. working on to make things easier along these lines. So okay. um, it's still like um, very like beta right now. So yes. um, yeah, there's okay. not much to show right now, but stay tuned. Yes, and there's a link in the uh, in the chat there for it. So here, actually, let me just so for the recording. Oops, let me back out of that and escape and click on this. So this is the blog post that um, Hector just linked to on Acquia.com. Although it's really talking about this Acquia Developer Studio right here. Okay, thank you, Hector. Oh, I just closed the wrong window. Red alert. Okay, get the chat going again. Okay, let's close this window. There we go. All right, so... Um, uh, you know, again, you can use Docker, you know, you can commit your Docker compose file um, to the project. You can use a Docker-based tool like Doxel, Lando, DDEV, that's kind of what I prefer, um, as well as virtual machines, um, which are kind of heavier, you know, like Drupal VM um, type stuff. Um, but, you know, whatever the whole team is comfortable with, if it can be a consistent local development environment, that's, that's definitely a good thing. Um, okay, so now we get to kind of the meat of, of this. And this was the, the, 
this was the kind of the impetus for this talk was this I see over and over and over again being a big mistake. And um, I'm sure anyone who's worked with uh, an organization that, with multiple stakeholders has seen this. Um, but the older I get, the, the more important I feel this step is. And that is, you know, making sure you are understanding and defining the information architecture with all the stakeholders, not just with the development lead, not just with your contact at the, you know, at the organization. So what I'm talking about is mainly defining entities, bundles, and fields, um, mapping an organization's data to the website. Um, and it's often, you know, it's, it, it it's often one of those things where it's more than just the developers who need to be involved in this conversation. So a lot of times it's the authors or maybe the marketing folks or the subject matter experts for a particular type of data. Um, making sure you have the right level of granularity in your bundles and fields without being too granular um, or too vague. You know, getting, hitting the nail on the head is really difficult and often requires prototyping. So six and seven are kind of one item, but they're two very different steps. So that's why I separated them out. Step six is really just having this conversation and making sure you get all the stakeholders, you know, involved in the conversation. Um, and to make your first pass at your entities, bundles and fields. Um, once you make your first pass, before you, you know, start building views, start thinking about starting your theme, you know, start building, you know, custom modules, prototype that information ar architecture with real content authors. Um, I have never been on a project where we've done this step and there haven't been changes based on feedback from authors. Um, it always makes the project better. Uh, I, I, you know, maybe someday I'll be on a project where we get it right, you know, after this step, but, you know, more often than, actually not more often than not, every single time so far for me at least, that we've put, you know, an, an ad content form or an ad, you know, term form or an ad user form in front of a, a content author, they've been changed. You know, oh, we forgot about this field. Or, oh, this is an integer field, but I really need it to be a decimal. Or, oh, how do I refer to this thing over there? Um, prototype the heck out of it. I have gone extremely lean with these prototypes meaning I will have this meeting or these meetings with, with the stakeholders, um, figure out, you know, have the conversations to kind of do a block diagram of all the entities and bundles and fields, and then take a few hours and just implement as much of that as I can in a, in a blank Drupal 8 site with Bardic. No theming, no display prettiness, nothing. This is all about testing the ad edit form with authors, making sure that the folks who are actually gonna enter the data have everything they need to enter the data to the right level of granularity. This step only saves time and money, every single time. Um, and it's iterative, right? So you define and implement the, the information architecture, stakeholders, authors, test that prototype. They're always gonna give you feedback. At least the first couple passes, you'll get feedback. You implement that feedback, and then you get send it right back to the stakeholders and the, and the authors. The, the quicker you can, you, you can make this loop go, the better feedback you're going to get. I try to make this so it's, an, you know, it's a day. You know, if I get feedback today, I'm going to try and make those changes so it's back in their laps tomorrow, so it's fresh in their mind. Because um, this will only ever make your data architecture better. Style guides, these are tough. These are tough, especially for small organizations that may not have a huge budget. Um, and the style guide, the scope of the, st the style guide is as much or as little as um, you feel is necessary to achieve the goals. And I know that's a very broad you know, definition, um, but the idea is that if you can identify things that occur frequently throughout a site. And the low hanging fruit on this is H1, H2, H3s. If you can look at a bunch of wireframes and say, these are all H1s, therefore all H1s should look like this. 
you know, this font, this size, this positioning, or this padding, things like that. Um, start with the low hanging fruit, um, and then go, you know, you know, move more towards, you know, maybe we have you know, menus in different places on the site. Well, let's try and create a consistent look for menus. So create a style guide just for menus. Say, okay, here's how a menu looks. Here's how a top level menu item looks. Here's how a secondary menu item looks. Um, the more you can do, the easier your wireframes become to generate. Because as you can, you know, create styles for different components of your page, then to create a new wireframe could be as easy as just grabbing different components and throwing them on a page and arranging them in a specific layout. Um, we can go further down this road and talk about component-based theming, which we're not gonna do. But I think if you're not doing anything with style guides, start simple. Um, get, you know, go for the low-hanging fruit because um, it will pay dividends as you, know, as you go. And resist one-offs. That's my, you know, I tell my clients, I don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to hide it with my clients. I'm very open. I'm, I'm going to tell them that, or I tell them we're going to create a style guide for these things and we're going to stick to it. Meaning don't come back to me and say, all H1s are the same except for this one. You know, I will push back, you know, on that because it's only going to cost time and money. It's going to lead to more CSS. It's going to be harder for you to maintain. So you've really got to convince me that this one-off is worth it. And I will more often than not try and figure out a different way to achieve the goal without you know, having a one-off H1 element. Uh, wireframes and mockups as necessary. Um, folks you know, tend to, or a lot of organizations I work with tend to go uh, one um, extreme or the other. One wireframe for the entire site or one wireframe per page for the entire site where they're generating so many wireframes and so many mockups. Again, I look for low hanging fruit. You know, you should do some, right? Landing pages generally need a wireframe. You know, your home page, maybe some internal landing pages. Um, try to have internal landing pages follow the same kind of structure and layout. That'll make everyone's job easier. Um, and then node pages. You know, generally, if you know, however many content types you have, you know, what should each of those node pages look like? Do these three content types look very similar? Well, let's just have one wireframe for all three of them. Look for opportunities to reuse design elements, reuse things from your style guide inside of your wireframes and mockups. Um, and obviously, responsive. <laughs> Um, I have a client right now, and I'm just, I have to look at who's in the room. I think it's safe, um, although this is recording, so I have to be careful. I've only ever gotten uh, mock-ups in wide. I think I may have gotten one uh, mobile a long time ago. Um, but it's extremely frustrating when, okay, great, this is how the site looks wide, but how does it look at, you know, a thousand pixels as opposed to 1400 pixels? How does it look at, you know, an iPad? How does it look on a mobile device? Um, you know, definitely take the time. And this is where, you know, I, I kind of, I, I'm shifting more towards style guides where, you know, what does the menu look like in mobile versus normal versus wide? Because um, if you can define those styles, then you can just drop, the results of those styles into wireframes and mockups. So again, make what's necessary, right? What's necessary to achieve, to, to, to build the site efficiently and sustainably. Uh, number 10, use Drupal 8's configuration system. Um, it, again, there's a learning curve to it. Um, it go, we go back to this diagram over here, and I mentioned it briefly. When you are making changes to code or configuration, you should only be doing that here. Meaning if you are, have to change a formatter setting, don't change that formatter setting here, change that formatting setting here, make sure it works the way you intend, and then export and commit that config. And then pull that config in and run a Drush config import. And then if that looks good, pull that config into here and run a Drush config import. I go so far, 
as to um, really insist with clients who have never used a configuration system before that we will be using config read only on remote environments, meaning it's impossible to change config on remote environments, forcing the process, right? Or enforcing the process that config changes happen locally and get committed and pushed. Um, because when you use the configuration system, you know, you are basically guaranteeing that, you know, nobody can mess with, you know, something that could break something. No one can go in and tinker with view X that has been themed within two inches of its life. And someone goes in there and adds another field and, you know, now the theme is all thrown off. Um, so the idea is it enforces a good process of developing locally. And, you know, obviously the other side of that is it uh, holds everybody accountable. If you want to change config, you know, it should be in a ticket in your project, uh, in your project tracker, the commit that changes that config should be linked back to that ticket. And then that config has to be pushed or pulled into dev, into test, into production, meaning it's tested in dev, then it's tested in stage, or test, or QA, whatever you call it, before you pull that into the production. Yeah, there's a little bit more overhead there, but again, the whole goal here is keeping a moat around production, keeping production safe, making sure changes that go into production have been vetted fully. And the last one is, you know, usually the toughest one with clients is define realistic and meaningful milestones. And again, a lot of this comes with um, experience and it also um, is very dependent on the relationship that you have with the, with the client. Um, the client could basically say, you know, the very first meeting we want to launch by September 1st. Okay. That's all fine and dandy, but what are the requirements? You know, what are the milestones to get there? And, okay, so here's your list of, of milestones. How big is the budget? You know, how many developers do we have on the project? How many full-time, how many part-time developers? Do we have the necessary skills in order to achieve these goals? Um, it's nice to have, you know, a goal, but they have to be realistic. And, you know, this is where a good project manager comes in is breaking down tasks, grouping those tasks into milestones that are based on actual developer bandwidth. Um, you know, it's tough sometimes if you are a contractor or if you are just a developer to have that conversation. Um, but, you know, pick your openings. And if you feel that a, a, a deadline is not realistic, you know, find the most diplomatic way possible to have that conversation. Because that, believe me, that conversation is a lot easier to have early in a development cycle than it is to have late. Um, just one quick question, Mike. Um, yeah. How do you how do you deal with technical debt as far as you know trying to meet deadlines? Because sometimes people have to either uh, whatever the tools you're using, or yeah. there's a learning curve, or there's other things. Uh, do you do you consider that as part important part of planning for the, the yeah i think you know i think those are tasks right okay. i think if the developer has to learn how to write bahat tests and you've got a deadline for 13 bahat tests of this friday you know the, there has to be time there has to be a task for developer x to learn bahat or there has to be a training opportunity for developer x to learn bahat so that's where the kind of the realistic you know, in my opinion, the realistic part comes in. Um, and I also think that the other half of this is like communication. You know, I understand crunch time. And I understand that, you know, there's a deadline coming up and we have to get it done. And, you know, you might incur some technical debt while you're doing that. But that technical debt needs to be documented. It needs to be documented either as a new task saying, look, because we didn't have enough time to do this right, you know, we got it kind of working by the deadline, but we now have these three tasks to go back and refactor what we, you know, what we previously wrote. I just want to say amen to that. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a key. That's where like a project tracker is so important 
Um, it, it, it's all, I mean, anyone who is, you know, who's been, who's been doing this for a while, you know, knows that communication is, you know, so much more important than a te technical skills for a lot of this stuff, right? Um, if you can communicate well, then your clients are going to, you know, want to keep you around or your employer is going to want to keep you around if you can communicate well. Um, I think the vast majority of employers slash clients value communication over technical skill because technical skill is something that you can learn in a fixed period of time. If you need to learn skill X, you can go away for six hours and learn skill X somewhere. If you can't communicate well, that's a, that's a, that's a much bigger problem, I think. Thanks, Mike. So, all right. Very good. Okay. So, uh, I, you know, th those are the 11 that I came up with over the course of two or three weeks while I was thinking about this. Uh, what did I miss, though? I got a big one for you. Yeah? Estimating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Because, like, if, 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 if you throw off your estimate, if you put out an estimate and your estimate is off, that can obviously, uh, like, set your... Uh, Screw up your project from the beginning. I mean, that kind of goes, I'm not going to, you know, that kind of goes with, where is it? Number 11, right? Realistic, yeah, yeah. meaningful miles. Because that, that is, you know, that is kind of the estimate. It does, yeah. But, uh, but you know, Mike, I'm sure you've seen this. I know I've seen it where you have a potential client and they come to you with their requirements and they come to you with a budget. Mm -hmm. And they're like, make this fit in there. And, you know, there are, you know, you can, you know, most people will do their due diligence and, and, and look at it and say, okay, well, this is going to take about that many hours. This is going to take about that many hours and kind of do a rough estimate and say, okay, well, what I came up with is a lot more than what your budget is. So then you have to have the conversation, right? You have to have the conversation of, you know, either A, I'm too expensive or B, we need to pare down your requirements. Or C, you need to come up with more budget. Um, yeah, estimating is, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I don't even want to talk about estimating. It's too well, I, yeah, that's why I want to ask you about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's, it's like the most difficult thing ever. Um, and um, like, do you have like a process? Do you break everything down? Do you just like, yeah. So what, rough it. Do what you... I do, it, it depends on the, uh, it depends on the, what I think the projected budget is going to be. Gotcha. Like, if I have like some little nonprofit, you know, not, I'm not talking down to nonprofits here. I want to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. But if I have a nonprofit that I know doesn't have a huge budget, um, then that's, that's, a, that's an easy conversation for me to have and say, look, I understand I have a big budget. You're asking for a lot. Here's what I can do for your budget. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and that's where I'm not even going to try to get more money out of them. You know, I just, I can kind of, you know, you kind of feel that out. If it's a bigger client and they come to me without a budget or they don't tell me what the budget is, but they have all of these, they basically send me a PDF with what they want. Generally what I'll do is I will trade days with them. Meaning I will give them four, six, eight hours of my time, mm -hmm. but I want four, six, eight hours of their time in exchange. So I won't charge them for it. It'll basically be Did I lose you? Um into no, I'm still here. Am I still He's here? Back. Oh, yeah, you, you dropped off a little bit. You dropped oh. off for like probably just about like five seconds or so. All right. So I'm trading time, right? I'm, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. give them free of charge four, six, eight hours of my time for four, six, eight hours of their time. Um, and the idea being that we're going to have an in-person meeting or a Zoom meeting, wh whatever it needs to be, and we're really going to dive into their requirements um, in order for me to give them an estimate that isn't just a bunch of hand waving, right? I, I mean, because I mean, most of the time, it, unless you really dive down and like you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So unless you really spend time with the client talking about their project, kind of getting an idea of we're going to need 
custom functionality for 12 entities, or maybe not 12, you know, you know, 12 different bundles, you know, between content types and vocabularies and things like that. Um, the theming doesn't look too bad because really it's, you know, two landing pages and then just a bunch of nodes. You know, they're not really asking for anything involving access control or this or that. So you, you, you kind of start looking for where the expensive bits are, kind of needling out, you know, where a lot of the time is going to be on the project. Um, the other thing I try and figure out is who's involved in the project? Where do I go? Um, or if I ask a question, am I still dropping in and out? Yeah, you're kind of dropping in and out, but but then I think like the audio catches up, you know, goes like a little quicker right. than Nick. Let me, I'll turn off my camera real quick. Knut is suggesting, so let me just turn off my camera just in case. Stop video, okay. Um, so we're, yeah, so with estimate, yeah. So what I'm, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the expensive bits and I'm looking for, um, I'm, I'm also actually looking for red flags, right? I'm looking for, to ask them questions to see if they, how well they thought out what they're asking for. Um, because if I ask them a question about what they want and they have no idea, and I feel it's, that's kind of a big deal, that's kind of a red flag. So that just means the uncertainty of my estimate has just gone way up. Um, so I use this, this spreadsheet. It's an old one. I'm gonna see if I can't Google for it. Civic actions estim, estimating spreadsheet. So I can find it. Uh, civic estimating. Specific actions. Oh man, I wish I could find it now. CV. Civic actions. Drupal estimate spreadsheet. Oh, here it is. Drupal estimate. No, that's not it. Civic action specifications worksheets. Oh, maybe this is it. Yeah, here we go. The original. Oh, it's not even there anymore. No. Oh no. How old is this one? Let's see. Oh, there's a law about article on it. Oh, here's a okay, well, here's a link to it. But anyway, I think there's a, there's actually a Google version of it as well, a Google Docs version of it. This is from <laughs> this is from 10 years ago. That's kind of funny. Um, but the the re thing I like about this spreadsheet is that you break down things by task. You assign them number of hours and the role that is responsible for that, whether it's a developer. Um, well, uh, you know, I use site builder, um, custom module, themer, project manager, different roles. Um, so you can assign a number of hours per role for each task. The thing I really like about this spreadsheet is then you can assign one to five an uncertainty factor. So if you assign a one, that basically says that you have a high degree of confidence that the estimate is actually going to be five hours. If you assign it an uncertainty of five, that means you have a very low <laughs> um, certainty that your estimate is going to be five, meaning it can be anywhere between one hours and 10 hours. So what happens is after you fill out all of your, all of your rows with all of your tasks and how many hours for each, um, each role and then your certainty factor of each task, the spreadsheet spits out not only an estimate, but also an estimate range based on the uncertainty. So that's a, for me, that's a really useful tool because then I can go to the client and say, look, here's my best guess, this number right here. But I am uncertain on a bunch of these tasks. So therefore, worst case, it's going to cost you this number over here. But we can get that number down by defining these other tasks better. So that's, you know, that's the main way that I, you know, estimate things is I break it down, I use that uncertainty factor. And then, you know, to be honest, I normally only need to do that for the first project I do with an organization or a client. Um, after that, generally, um, the trust relationship has been established and 
they can just ask me what I think it's going to take. And I can, you know, generally tell them based on our history and what I know about their project. And we can just go from there. Um, yeah, but estimating, that's a whole, that's a, that's a whole art. I wish I could find that. Um, yeah, Knut's asking me, so let me take another minute, see if I can't find that. Uh, civic actions, estimation, estimate, Google, Google Sheet. Oh, look at that, and I found it right there. Yep, this is it. Okay, so this is the Google Doc version. This is the one I actually still use. So I will put this into the chat. And then also what I will do is we've had a couple links here. So let me go to, I'll add a comment here with some of these links. So we just do um, for Zoom people uh, that, that have used, haven't used Zoom before, if you click on the chat area, there's a link for more. And under that, when you click on that, you'll see save chat. And then when you uh, end the Zoom, it'll actually create a text file with all the messages in chat. Thank you, Hector. Does this use Markdown? I can use Markdown here. Okay, right. Okay, so this is Civic. What's it? Actions. Okay. Estimating worksheet. And then did you create developer studio link I'll put in there? Acquia Developer Developer Studio coming soon info. And then the other one I did was the um, Drupal project, Drupal com composer template. And then while I'm here, I'll just put this links to slides. And 11 to the so this is share. Uh, let's see, what do I have this set for? Oh, no, no, no. Anyone with the link. Anyone with the link can view. There we go. There's the link. Disable. Okay, there we go. I think that's the four of them. Let's make sure that renders properly. <laughs> Not a whole lot of uh, text there, but it gets the job done. Okay, um, and I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So um, the last time I gave this, someone else talked about documentation. Asked about, you know, doc, doc, you know developer documentation or, or author documentation or Oh, site owner documentation. Again, I think that's, you know, that comes down to using a project tracker and those should be tasks. Those should be tasks and they should be, you know, part of the schedule. You know, if you want documentation, you have to give your developers time and you have to pay for their time to write that documentation. It doesn't just magically appear. So as developers, we have to be smart enough to ask for that time, right? Just like we have to be smart enough to, you know, um, add a task saying, I need to learn skill X. That should be a task that if you need that skill, then you should pay me to learn that skill. So, all right, that's all I got. Any questions? No, okay, the other thing I wanna put in here is just so we keep some type of record, I'm gonna edit my, I'm just gonna put everyone's first name, if that's cool, who's here. So, so I, I actually have another question. All right. I have all the questions. Is it, is it too late? No, no, no. Let me just write this down. Attendees. So we have Mike H, Knut, Hector, Linda, Linda, Sarah, Will, Roger. Is that it? Okay, Roger. All right, what's up, Mike? So like when you're talking about like every single commit references an issue within your tracker. Yeah. There's certain issue, like there's certain situations where you're like, you know, you might be like doing, 
some QA toward the end of the project right. and you're finding like, you know, maybe like a miscellaneous, um, you know, visual bug where you just kind of need to change like your margin top from, yeah. you know, yeah. one, one unit to two units. Do you go ahead and do that? Or do you like, you know, take the time to log the issue, to put, pull the issue into the sprint, to relate the issue, create a pull request <laughs> and, and, and all that thing for like yeah. what would literally be like one line of like CSS. I, so I really like to see every commit tied to a task. Okay. That doesn't mean that every commit is tied to a task, but I, yeah. I, I try. So what I've done in the past is I have created a task that is kind of like a, a odds and ends task that basically says, you know, here's what I was doing. We're pushing to launch. Um, you know, I found these four things and I, you know, and I fix them. And that way you have a task that those four commits can point to, even if it's not a separate task per one, you know, I'm not saying you always have to do it, you know, but you know, my personality, I like to, yeah. I, I'm very much all or nothing. So when I decide I want to have a, a you know, a, 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 a commit message that, ties to something in the project tracker, I try and do it for every single one. But you know, I get it that that's not always possible. And you know, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty that I don't tie to, to one, but uh, I try to be pretty good about it. Cool. Well, here's a, I'm a question regarding this domain. Yeah. Uh, given that you online where your cursor is at the moment, you talk about documentation, I would have thought that the Estimator, spreadsheet, whatever, has some sort of a documentation line item. Now, based on your experience, then of course the group has come to present. What do we say that the documentation is? Is it 10% of the project time? Is it 15, 20? How do you follow it, it, it totally depends what the client wants documented, right? I mean, if the client wants every custom module, like a you know a, a a a wiki page explaining the you know what every custom module does that's one thing. If the client wants you know extensive code comments in those custom modules, that's another thing. If a client is looking for just documentation for their authors, you know how do I add a new blah? You know that's 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 a very different thing. If, if the client's looking for documentation on you know how do I um, update this panels based landing page. So I don't, I don't think I've ever done like a flat percentage for a documentation line item. I, I'm, I think I'm annoying to clients when, because I, in the, in the sense that I'm, I really put clients feet to feet to the fire in figuring out what they want. Cause a lot of times they don't know what they want. And if they don't know what they want, then how could they expect me to give them a number? So I, ha you know, you know what I have done, Canute, is I have, I have said, I'll tell you what, I will give you, you know, we'll put in the budget 15 hours of documentation time. I don't know what kind of documentation that is. I don't know. Maybe it's a screencast or a bunch of screencasts. Maybe it's written documentation. You know, but, you know. You guys want documentation. You can't tell me what kind of documentation you want right now. Well, let's budget for 15 hours worth and, you know, see how that goes. Thank you. Yep. yep. Will's asking uh, if Adam counts as an attendee. I'm going to say no because he bailed on us early. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to, can you, I'm going to repeat your question because I know that we're going to try the automatic transcribing and your audio is really low. So just in case, it didn't come through. Knut uh, was asking, how do we estimate documentation? Do we, you know, does it make sense to do it as a percentage of the project or the project budget, something like that? So. All right, any other questions? All right, look at that, 7 p.m., exactly. We are, we are on the ball. All right, well, cool. Thanks, everyone, for... Um, you know, joining me here for the first Florida virtual meetup, Florida Drupal virtual meetup. Sorry uh, to, I guess it's just Linda. Linda, you and I could have hung out tonight. Um, 
and got some pizza afterwards, but we'll have to wait till uh, next time <laughs> to do that. Yeah, it's uh, a little far to go right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so next month, like we said, next month is Chris from Jacksonville, right? Do I have that right? Yeah, Chris from Jacksonville. Um, so June 18th, 6 p.m. If uh, anything that we could have done to improve, um, just add as a comment here, or ping Adam on the Drupal Slack or anything like that. Um, Adam and I are going to be getting this up to YouTube tomorrow and checking the transcription and all that and getting the word out about this. So uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great evening. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody.